America has an eviction crisis, and Richmond, Virginia is ground zero. Our eviction rate here in Richmond is 11.44 percent, the second highest in the U.S. amongst its large cities. Imagine a single mother. She works every day. She has a full-time job. It's not a lot, but it's enough to take care of the rent, the bills. One morning when she goes to work, she is told that her hours will be reduced, and without any other source of income, she will not be able to pay her rent. Her landlord files an eviction lawsuit against her, and she is ultimately put out of her home. She is forced to stay with family members and friends because she doesn't have anywhere to go. This has an impact on her child's attendance at school. The school staff begin to notice the chronic absenteeism and tardiness, and despite interventions to help this mother, she is unable to、um, correct the situation. This mother, who is doing the best she can, ends up in court with a failure to send petition filed against her because she is unable to get her child to school. She faces a fine, money she does not have, all because she was evicted. Now, the scenario that I just described to you is something that I know a lot about.、Um, for 10 years, I was a prosecutor in the city of Richmond, and、um, I've seen these types of cases over and over again. And I may not remember the names of the individuals, I may not remember the faces, but the hardship that they endured still lingers with me to this day. And what it makes clear is that our children are not protected, and eviction is a social child welfare problem. That's been hiding in plain sight. Now, in Virginia, the eviction process goes like this: on the first of the month, your rent is typically due.、Um, maybe the fifth, if there's a grace period. If you are unable to pay, the, if you do not pay, the landlord can file,、um, give notice to you, a five-day pay or quit. And in that time period, you have to either pay or leave. If you do neither,、um, your landlord can file a, an eviction lawsuit. This process can take from less than a month to a car. In less than a month, you can be facing the threat of homelessness. And in Richmond, approximately 18,000 eviction lawsuits are filed annually. To put that into perspective, that's about 40,000 individuals. 40,000 individuals in the city of Richmond every year who face the threat of homelessness. And of those 18,000 lawsuits that are filed, 11,000 of those result in a favorable outcome for the landlord, meaning a monetary judgment or the、um, the right to put the tenants out. Whatever way you boil it down, at the end of the day, what that means is that you have every day you have children, you have families that are、um, evicted or facing the threat of eviction in the city of Richmond. And how this all happened is that、um, when you're you're looking at evictions in the city of Richmond, and even when you're looking at race in this country, we have to go back to through history. For the last 400 years in this country, race has played an integral part in determining how someone can enjoy their inalienable rights. Their rights to life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. This is a concept that was included in the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. However, that concept was derived from John Locke. Interestingly, John Locke actually、um, substituted out pursuit of happiness for property, or should I say, Thomas Jefferson substituted out pursuit of happiness for property.、Um, but whatever way you look at it, whatever P you adopt. Property, pursuit of happiness—it's been clear throughout the course of America's history that、um, it was not to be meant to be enjoyed equally by all members of、um, of this country. And in fact,、um, it's race's determining factor, and race's determining and who has been able to enjoy those rights. Now, race has also. Been a significant factor in determining where one can live and one can raise their family.、Um, in the 1930s,、um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a New Deal agency, 
surveyed um, the communities and neighborhoods of um, some of the largest U.S. cities, and they surveyed them based on loan desirability and riskiness. They generated um, a map, or should I say generated maps, which were color-coded and categorized um, to determine whether that, that community or that neighborhood was one that was um, appropriate to lend, their lending desirability. Black neighborhoods and neighborhoods of um, color were consistently categorized to be high risk. Therefore, those people in those communities were fenced out of um, or not permitted to obtain mortgages and other types of housing loans. This practice, commonly known as redlining, actually was outlawed over some 50 years ago, but its effects um, can still be felt to this day. Research has shown that um, race and redlining is a significant factor in the disparity of wealth that we have to this day between um, black people and the white people in this country. But Richmond, Virginia also bears the scars and is tarnished by the practice of redlining. Um, research conducted by the RBA Eviction Lab shows that um, race is a significant or one of the most prominent determining factors when analyzing um, which neighborhoods are most at risk of having high eviction rates. And that's after controlling for other values, such as property value, as well as poverty. What's even more alarming is that when you look at the neighborhoods in Richmond that have the highest eviction rates, um, it shares the same geographic markers as those neighborhoods who, um, who were red redlined um, in those redlining maps from the 1930s. But it's not just evident in those particular factors. Um, it's not just evident um, the, the race and how this plays a factor in who can live. It's not just evident in the, what we, can, we typically consider to be impoverished um, communities by the sprawling housing um, developments or dilapidated buildings. But it's also something that is seen in the disparities that our children face when it comes to the, to, um, to the education and their ability to thrive. Research shows that families with children get evicted at a higher rate. And that's for many factors. But what we talk about today is because of the um, affordability, as well as um, housing affordability, as well as discriminatory practices that may be in place. Let's face it, children are expensive. After paying for rent, utilities, other household necessities, there's just not a, lot, not a left, left over at the end of the month if an emergency arises. So a family who has an unexpected medical expense, uh, one uh, unexpected major car repair, can find themselves being one month away from facing homelessness. And this idea of race and eviction is also evident in um, our children's education or ability to learn. Imagine being a child who's facing um, eviction or has in fact been evicted, and instead of focusing on you know, reading, writing, and the arithmetic, they're focused on shelter, clothing, and food. Now, it has to be hard to try to focus when you're in survival mode. Um, and, even, and also, the research shows that there's a correlation between absenteeism, chronic tardiness, and evictions. Also, in Richmond, 10 of the 18 elementary schools um, that are in areas or communities where the eviction rate is higher than the city's average ha are not accredited. So why is that the case? Well, these communities are already overtaxed and under-resourced. And then to add to that, you have children who may be moving from place to place when it comes with that, um, the instability. 
um, the, the teachers already being pulled into other directions, but now having to take in new students who may need to have some type of remediation. And at the end of the day, what it shows is just that it's already taxing an overtaxed system, and the resources are just that there to embrace these children the way they need to be embraced to get them through this struggle. It is common for children who are caught in this eviction process, um, or should I say trauma of the eviction process, they may commonly act out. There is a correlation between delinquency and the eviction. Now, for an adult going through this trauma of an eviction, having to found housing, trying to figure out where you would stay from day to day, is, is, is something that's hard, can be difficult emotionally and mentally to process. Now, as a child who doesn't have the emotional maturity to actually process those, process those feelings and process what it all means, they may not know what's going on, but they know it doesn't feel good. And in a school setting, or even in a community, unable to process those feelings, that child may act out. And it's particularly in school, if they're acting out, that may bring that negative attention, where they may get put out of school, or they may drop out of school, which leads to they're having an impact on the rest of their lives, the inability to secure stable jobs. And it goes back to housing. Without a stable job, you're unable to you know, buy that home or get a home in a, in a decent area. And so that cycle repeats, that generational wealth that was taken away or that was something that, that was taken away is no longer in their grasp because of the behavioral issue that resulted from that eviction. Now, how do we fix this situation? One-time rent relief programs that assist and help with the imminent crisis, um, they're good. They're gap fillers. You can say they're band-aids, but there's not a long-term solution. There needs to be some systematic changes to um, address this issue. One being um, allowing for unlawful detainers, which is the name for an eviction lawsuit, to be um, dismissed or, I'm sorry, expunged from a person, a tenant's record. Currently, there is no system in place. So even if a, if a tenant is able to successfully challenge a, a, um, a, an eviction case and is dismissed, it still remains on their record. And that leads me to the second point. Um, currently, an unlawful detainer or an eviction stays on a tenant's record for, um, on a court system for 10 years. That's a long time. And things can drastically change in 10 years. But yet, that's a stain on that, that person, on that tenant's record, that they would have to explain to a potential landlord, therefore limiting their ability to get decent, get, obtain decent housing, all because of something that may have occurred when they were in that rut, in that bad month, in that bad time period in their life. And another suggestion is that having local school systems partner up with um, legal aid organizations and other resources in the community. Um, teachers and school social workers are on the front lines of this. They are the first to notice when a child may be impacted, um, their education may be impacted, um, or see the, absentee, um, ab the absenteeism rate increasing. Allowing those families to have those resources at their disposal may just be what they need to redirect them and get them on a path before um, things get worse. Now, I remember vividly as a child um, gathering around the TV with my mom during the holiday time, actually. Um, we would watch The Wizard of Oz because it would come on around Thanksgiving time every year. And I remember mimicking Dorothy as she clicked her shoes together and would say, there's no place like home. And now that I'm an adult, um, those words can't be any more truer because um, your home is not just the structure, the roof um, that you live in. It's a place where memories are created. Um, it's a place where um, celebrations occur. But for a lot of kids in Richmond, Virginia, and of course throughout this nation, they've been stripped of their opportunity to have a place to call home um, and to have a place to, to have those good, fond memories. It doesn't have to be that way. And now is the time to make those systematic changes so that every children can enjoy 
a place to call home.